from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Lloyd, Director of the Veterans History Project, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Library of Congress and our Behind the Mic panel discussion to examine the interviewer's role and experience with oral history. Oral history is a principal conduit for folklore. It is through oral history that we're able to learn about the life experiences and perspectives of individuals who might not otherwise appear in historical records. Recorded interviews provide uniqueness through the qualities of human voice, that is, its expression like inflections, hesitation, dialect, and emotional range. The content of these interviews also provide a rich human interaction. As I watch and listen to the stories in our archive, as well as meet the veterans and their loved ones face to face, I am more and more grateful for our veteran service and sacrifice. I am thankful that Congress understood that oral history aspect of folklore when it established the Veterans History Project in the year 2000. Congress established VHP as a project within the American Folk Life Center of the Library of Congress because it was seen as an appropriate repository to collect, preserve, and make available to the public an archive of oral histories. In two days, we will celebrate our 17th anniversary, and I am so proud to report that we currently hold more than 104,000 collections of selfless service of our brave women, men and women who served in the US military from World War I through the current conflicts. It would have been impossible for our staff to archive this much history without the direct involvement of organizations like Witness to War, the Vietnam War Commemoration, members of Congress, and volunteers from across the, the country who interview veterans in their lives and in their communities. In addition to the interviews, they also donate, donate other historic materials, such as original photographs, letters, diaries, journals, two-dimensional artwork, and official military documents, at a rate of about 100 per week. The Veterans History Project engages veterans from every branch of service and their loved ones, and our content is used by researchers, educators, students, authors, filmmakers, and the general public. We are deeply honored to host this panel where we get to take a peek behind the curtain of the interviewer experience. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished panel. I'd like to start with Joe Galloway, a native Texan. Joe, Joe joined the United Press International as a reporter in 1961. During his 22 years with UPI, Joe served in nearly a dozen news bureaus in, Amer in the American Midwest and also Asia. Joe began a 16th month tour of Vietnam as a war correspondent beginning in April 1965, shortly after the first American combat troops arrived in Vietnam. He did three other tours in Vietnam, one in 1971, one in 73, and his last in 1975, covering the fall of Saigon. Joe spent 20 years as a senior editor and senior writer for the US News and World Report magazine, and just recently retired as a senior military correspondent for Knight Ritter newspapers. Joe served as a special consultant to General Colin Powell at the State Department, that had to have been amazing, and co-authored several books. He is most often recognized as the co-author of the national best-selling book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, with General Hal Moore. The book was later turned into a feature film in, 19, in 2002, starring Mel Gibson as General Moore. More recently, Joe has been portrayed by Tommy Lee Jones in the film Shock and Awe a reflection of his reputation for journalistic integrity. He has received numerous awards for his writing, but I think he would tell you his most significant recognition came in 1998 when the Army awarded him a Bronze Star for rescuing a wounded soldier under fire in November 1965. This was the only such medal for valor awarded to a civilian 
by the Army for actions undertaken during the Vietnam War. Next, we have Emily Carley with the Witness to War Foundation. Thank you, Emily. A nonprofit 501c3 founded in 2001 and dedicated to capturing the stories of individual combat veterans, honoring them, and educating future generations about the price of freedom and extraordinary valor for our forebearers. The Witness to War Foundation is dedicated to understanding as much as possible what it was like to be there. Emily is an Atlanta native and a 2006 graduate of the University of Tennessee with a BABS in marketing. Her grandfather was a World War II and Korean War veteran and is featured on the Witness to War website. He's Tank Commander Andrew Carpenter, in case you're going to check it out later. Emily originally assisted with interviewing and website content selection prior to moving into the director position. Emily has been working with the foundation since 2006, where today she is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the foundation, including partnership and media contacts and web website management. Next to Emily is Guha Shankar, a folk life specialist at the American Folk Life Center. Guha is involved in a range of public outreach programs, including the Civil Rights Project, a national initiative to conduct surveys of existing oral history collections with relevance to the civil rights movement, and to record new interviews with people who participated in the movement. The recollections of interviewees cover a wide variety of topics about the freedom struggle, such as the influence of organized labor, nonviolence and self-defense, and the importance of faith, music, family, and friendships. And that last piece as a veteran really resonates with me. Like many of our veterans, the individuals involved in the civil rights movement fought bravely for what they believed in. They often experienced intense, traumatic events that have ultimately defined their life. Their actions and moments in time are meaningful, not just to the individuals, but also for larger history. Events discussed in these interviews incurred the, include the murder of 14-year-old Emmett Till in 1955, the Freedom Rise in 61, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 63, the Selma to Montgomery Rights March in 65. The 130 plus interviews are a permanent part of the recently opened National Museum. Guhag earned his PhD in 2003 from the Department of Anthropology, University of Texas, Austin, with a concentration in folklore and public culture. Prior to undertaking his graduate studies, he was a media production specialist and document documentary film producer at the Center for Folklife Programs at the Smithsonian Institution's Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. As an Army Colonel, I am thrilled to welcome our next panel member and my compatriot, Mark, Colonel Mark Franklin. Through Colonel Franklin's 30 years of service, he held a variety of positions, starting as a weapons platoon leader and culminating as a political military advisor as the Okinawa Area Coordinator and Senior Country Director in the China, Asia, and Pacific Securities Office Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, where he was responsible for developing military-to-military -military relations as a military-to-military -military relationship with China. Mark currently serves as the Chief History and Legacy Branch for the Vietnam War Commemoration. Vietnam War Commemoration was created in 2008 by act of Congress and will last until Veterans Day 2025. The mission of the commemoration is to assist our nation in thanking and honoring Vietnam veterans, their families, the fallen, those who were held prisoner of war, and those that are still unaccounted for. In support of that mission, the History and Legacy Branch strives to provide the American public with a clearer understanding and appreciation of the service sacrifice of our veterans and ensure the legacy of their service endures for future generations. Lastly, our moderator, thank you Andrew, last but not least, is Dr. Andrew Ringley. Dr. Ringley is a historian for the Vietnam War Commemoration. He received his PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2016. He works on the Vietnam War Commemoration's Oral History Project conducting interviews in Washington, D.C., 
and several other cities. Andrew received numerous academic awards, including a Fulbright Hayes to conduct dissertation research in Russia in 2013. I will now turn the microphone over to Andrew, who will explain the format of today's panel. Thank you, Andrew. I would like to thank uh, Karen Lloyd for that warm introduction and for hosting us here. And I'd also like to thank Carrie Ward for her help in, in bringing this panel into being. Um, first of all, I will answer or ask the panelists several questions, both panel, uh, general, general questions, the entire panel, and a couple specific to individuals on the panel. Then afterwards, I would like to open the discussion to the audience, and uh, I would encourage you to ask questions for panelists, um, either for the entire panel or for individuals on the panel. Um, oral history is important for its critical ability to fill in the gaps in our historical records, enables us to capture and preserve accounts that we would otherwise lose, be they subaltern voices or even people who are very important who choose not to uh, commit their thoughts to written prose. Um, an introduction question for everyone um, on this panel is, can you describe a moment when you realize in an interview uh, that what the interviewee was saying had changed your understanding of a historical event or process. And perhaps we can start with Guha. Oh, thanks. Um, I think I go back to uh, one of the very first uh, interviews that I was a part of here at the library. I've done several as, on my own. But I was acting as uh, the sound recorder for an interview that we did during the opening of the World War II Memorial here on the Mall and memory escapes me, uh, it was at least, uh, it was a long time ago, it was about at least 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the people whom we were interviewing was this elderly gentleman um, who had been brought here by his congressman from Michigan. Um, and in the course of the interview, I want to cut to the, uh, the point, uh, he had never, uh, as I found out as I was talking to his uh, two uh, adult daughters, they said, he has never talked about his war experiences t to us ever. And so for them, it was a moment to listen and understand from their father's uh, own words what his experiences were. And in the course of the interview, uh, he starts talking about uh, essentially being transported at the end of the war, having been shot down, 19-year-old, uh, sent across uh, the border and into uh, uh, Germany, uh, somewhere near the Polish border, I think. And he says at that moment, uh, and this is a capstone argument. He says, I didn't realize until they told me where we were uh, going to be barracked that it was the birthplace of my grandparents. And yes, I heard the uh. <laughs> I did that, the interviewer did that, and behind me, whose two grown daughters did that. And the trauma that he's talking about, perhaps of not, uh, the reason he just kept quiet for all those years, and he said, I never told anybody in my unit where I was or who my grandparents were. So that kind of erasure of his own family history in the, in the middle of this trauma, which is you know, already you know, for a 19 year old being transported 40 men to a boxcar across enemy lines, um, had to be doubly and triply so. And that adds to a dimension of understanding, which I think going back to your point, which you just would not get just reading the text of that account alone. And to hear it from his own voice and then the other shock of that is amplified by the fact that his two you know, daughters coming towards the end of their father's life, he was an elderly man after all, close to his 80s, um, that is also that kind of intensification of what happens when you're listening to an oral history. And that profoundly changed my perception of what I thought I knew about the war, which is obviously you know, a lot of John Wayne stuff going on. Um, so my answer is going to be a little bit broader because my evolution into interviewing was a little bit different probably than some of the other people on the panel. Um, I actually started out doing World War II interviews for the Witness to War Foundation. Um, when I started with the group, that was our main focus because we were trying to capture as many World War II interviews as we could while these veterans were still with us and are still with us. Um, and in more recent years, our focus has shifted towards the Vietnam veteran. Um, which I personally did not have a lot of experience with, just by the nature of the work I was doing. And it had always been kind of my understanding that Vietnam veterans may not be incredibly comfortable talking about their experiences. Obviously, 
the coming home process for them was a little bit different. Um, and they, I, I'd always had the impression that maybe not to ask the questions, maybe not to try to talk about the Vietnam War. Um, so when we started to get into these interviews, it was a little bit of a different arena for me. And what I realized was that it wasn't so much that they didn't want to talk about it, it was that we weren't asking them. We were not asking them to share these stories. We were not opening up this outlet for them. And so it was a unique experience for me to see these interviews starting to come out, see these gentlemen starting to open up about their experiences and the cathartic process for them. Um, one in particular that stands out to me was a gentleman that I did um, an interview with in a small town outside of Atlanta. And I can't even remember how we came together um, anymore, but it was clear to me that he had not shared his story very much. Um, I think I just happened to come along at the right time. He actually um, was a very soft-spoken Southern gentleman who kind of, I feel like, was looking for an outlet to, to finally share these experiences. And so when we sat down, I didn't know a lot about what he was going to share, but it turned out to be one of the most profound and poignant interviews I've ever done. He sits down and he starts talking about being in a mountain yard village in Vietnam as it was overrun by the Viet Cong. And his severe wounds and basically sitting in a tunnel with a grenade in his hand, deciding if he wanted to be captured or if he wanted to pull the pin on the grenade himself. And I'm sitting there as he's telling this just in awe because these were the types of stories that I had not heard before. I didn't know much about Vietnam, and here he was sharing it with me as an interviewer who he had just met. And I think that's what's so vastly important for us is that we're the keepers of these memories for them, that we show our interest in what they're talking about. Um, we're asking the right questions and that we can be there for them to share the experience. And that, to me, was kind of this turning point in switching from World War II to Vietnam that I I reflect back on that interview often and I share it often because I think he was looking for an outlet and I was more than thrilled to provide that for him. I'm not sure I can put my finger on an aha moment in the 300 plus interviews I've done over the last four years with uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, but what I would say is that I learned something new about that war from every single veteran that I interview. Uh, they open up to me, perhaps in a special way, if for no other reason than I've been there where they were for four tours in Vietnam as a war correspondent and have written books and worked as a journalist for 55 years and built a almost unprecedented level of trust among military people. Uh, I learned as a young reporter that uh, the, the military is a very small, tightly contained world, especially professional military officers and uh, the communication among them is, is swift. And uh, if you deal fairly with one, all of them hear about it. And controversially, if you screw one of them, you've done them all and you will never get cooperation. You will never set foot on a military base again with, except as a hostile so identified. Uh, so I, I sit down and talk to them and I find they open up very easily and tell stories they've told no one else. You know, you can, um, you can get a sense of what combat is like by watching it on TV, seeing uh, Hollywood portrayals, even reading really, really good books by very, very good authors. But it's when you hear it from the veteran's own mouth that it really kind of brings it home. And our very, very first, in fact, Joe's very, very first interview was uh, General Tom Hill, San, San Antonio. And I thought I knew something about war and combat. I've been fortunate with a few close calls in Pakistan. I've never really had a shot fired at me in anger, but I thought I knew something about it until I heard Tom Hill 
explained in a firefight when he was a platoon leader, having one of his young soldiers die on his lips as he was giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Now that really brings it home. And I think for me that was probably, and it was our very, very first interview, and I thought, wow, we are really in for quite a ride. So I think the perspectives that you get from combat veterans really is what brings it home, and that is probably the first profound effect it had for me. Um, Emily, as an interviewer, uh, you often have to listen between the lines. Um, how do you think an interviewee's responses shape uh, your subsequent questions? Um, do they, and in what ways like that? Um, absolutely. Our questions are vitally important to the content of the interview. Um, and I've seen this across the spectrum by starting out with interviewing World War II veterans and then now interviewing people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And obviously, the storytelling styles are different. The memories are fresher or more distant. Um, and so it's imperative that as an interviewer, you do know what to look for and not stick to a set list of questions. We have a list of questions that we kind of use for reference, but as we're going through an interview, we're always jotting down notes, things to come back to. Um, it's um, important for us not to interrupt an interviewee because we don't want to get them off track from a story that they're telling. But it's always picking up on those little nuggets of information, you know, maybe a village that they passed through or something that they saw as they're describing a larger story and being able to come back to that because some of, sometimes those turn into fantastic stories, fantastic insights, um, things that we can draw back on in other parts of the interview. Um, and then also, if you have somebody who isn't quite comfortable telling their story, it's incredibly important that you can help guide them. So help draw out things that they might not remember or that they might not be thinking about at the time. Um, so if you have somebody that's more reluctant, you can use those things that you pick up on to help further them in their stories and develop those memories for videotape. Um, Mark, as a veteran yourself, um, you have the ability to establish a special rapport with veterans when you're conducting oral history interviews. Um, what are the, both the opportunities and the challenges that your status as a former professional soldier present when you're interviewing a veteran? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's true. Regardless of the service that you serve in, all military members share one common experience. That would be their initial entry training, which is its own form of shock and awe. And then, of course, understanding military chain of command and some of the vernacular. But then when you get down to the separate services, and for me being Army, when you talk to um, the guys that serve on the ground, both Marines and, and Army, you also share a common experience, and so they do tend to take some things for granted. So when you take, talk about challenges, one of the things that we, the first thing we tell a veteran when we sit down is we, we explain, you know, you and I understand a certain language. We use certain acronyms and terms, and, but remember your audience. The audience may not remember or not know what that acronym or term is, so when you see it or use it, try to remember to spell it out or explain it, and if you don't, we'll try to remind you to do so. So they get it right away, and there's this, um, this understanding that, yeah, we, we speak the same language, not everybody may understand it. Uh, in terms of a combat veteran, uh, nobody, just like I said earlier, where I don't, it, you really can't understand combat unless you've experienced it. The combat veteran can't really explain it to someone who's never been there. They get the sense that maybe they don't understand. And we're finding now, finally, these Vietnam veterans are willing to open up uh, and, and kind of express some of those experiences. But the guy they really open up to is someone who's been there. And that's the gentleman on my right. So that would probably be a good segue to your next question. That is an excellent segue to the next question. Um, Joe, as a reporter um, it, who worked in Vietnam and then published about Vietnam, many of your interview subjects know who you are. Some of them have even come down and sat for the interview because they know you're going to be there and they have that opportunity to meet you. Um, how do you think that your, um, or, or the, the, the interviewee's knowledge of you, your biography, how do you think it affects the interview? I, I don't, certainly don't think it gets in the way. Uh, I think they open up to me far more readily uh, because they know, I know whereof they speak. I've uh, stood there while they were dying and 
bleeding all around me. I've carried the wounded. I've carried the dead. I've carried them water and ammunition and on occasion unslung my rifle and put it to use because otherwise maybe we were all going to die there. Uh, I, it's absolutely true. You cannot explain combat thoroughly to someone who has never seen or more importantly heard and smelled it. I, I even, I, uh, you know, even a skilled writer can't put down words on paper to explain what 2,000 dead bodies in a circle less than 200 meters around who have been rotting in the hot tropical sun for three days, what that smell is like. I can't explain it to you, but I can never get it out of my nose and out of my mind. Uh, they're just plain going to open up and talk to me because they know I understand whereof they speak. And as a kid, my father and six of his brothers and four of my mother's brothers all wore the uniform in World War II. And when we were little kids, when they came home, we wanted war stories and we pestered them. And all we got from them were the lighthearted stories, the jokes, the funny stuff, never what we really were looking for and I never heard that from any of these uncles that I loved and respected until I came home on leave from my first tour in Vietnam. And one of my favorite uncles uh, uh, was a bomber pilot in the Pacific. And uh, I noticed that at family reunions, he, he couldn't take a crowd. He would disappear out the back door and walk out in the woods and just kind of wander around. And when I came home on leave, I found that I had the same disposal toward no crowds at all. And I wandered out behind him. And we stood out there in the woods and he told me his stories. He could share. Now, he couldn't share before. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a, a, both a blessing and a curse. Um, Guha, um, your uh, experience doing interviews is, is unique because many, the three of us, or four of us actually, um, particularly work with veterans and, and we're asking them questions about their military service. Many of your subjects, while they served in war, they then went on to do, to to um, do all sort, perform all sorts of other great accomplishments. And, and how does the trauma and the experience of, of 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 serving in a war and and going through the military experience then inform their later actions and the way they think about um, about those actions? Right, and I, I suppose I should say this is with specific regard to the fact that many of the people who int we interviewed for the Civil Rights History Project are African Americans, and not just African Americans. But with, uh, going back to your question, the way in which the war, the experiences of war, uh, influenced how they then uh, performed later in civilian life was that it brought home to them, I think, in a very real and visceral way, the idea of uh, two separate nations in this country. And the trauma, I think, that they experience, and you can hear this, it's replete in the accounts going back to World War I of anybody who was in service who happened to be a person of color, was that notion of going abroad to fight for freedom when you're denied very of those, many of those same freedoms at home. You know, there's World War I veterans who talk about coming off the victory ships, uh, landing at port, and the white officer says, whites to the left, color to the right. So on the front lines, while you were busy serving and fighting for freedom and waving flags and taking the notion of American democracy and the American project into Europe and to other theaters, you're plunged back into a situation in which you are, again, a second-class citizen. 
and you know, men and women, and men especially who served on the front lines bravely, are again relegated to the status of boy back at home. And that thread carries itself through, I think, mo any one of the interviews in any of the major theaters of war, the Korean War, uh, and the Vietnam War, if you haven't and I read it already, and uh, I'm not sure that M M Joe's um, accounts deal with this, but certainly the most traumatic experiences of African-American soldiers in Vietnam can be found in Wallace Terry's amazing oral histories with 20 African-American veterans called Bloods. Um, I highly recommend it. It changed my experiences of my, it amplified my understanding of what war must have been like. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend I know what war is like just because I heard somebody talk about it. But you get that intensification of experience as told to them by those folks. Um, and again, going back to your question, the way in which many people who interviewed the Civil Rights History Project who served in Korea, I would say, who then became, who came fully grown into the civil rights era, um, again, it intensified their notion that there was an injustice which was replete at all levels of American society and they needed to change it. And that's where they devoted much of their life to. And many of them did sit on the sidelines, but several significant people, uh, several significant members like James Foreman went on to work with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, led actions in the front lines of the South. Um, and there's another interesting connection. I have, uh, I've only had heard the notion of trauma and PTSD with regard to veterans. And then having embarked on this project five years ago with the Civil Rights History Project, the same set of phrases, trauma, shock, terror, uh, alienation, being out of place, PTSD, all came up in the words of people who had never served in war, but who had served on the front lines in the danger zones of the US South when they were taking actions for civil rights and freedom for black people. Um, and it's actually, in a w strange way, I think, piggybacks off this, but um, um, when we talk about oral history, we are often, by collecting these stories, we are commemorating our subjects' lives, too, and their contributions that they've made to history. And Mark, could you talk a little bit about how the oral history project conducted by the Vietnam War commemoration um, achieves the objectives of the commemoration and how it co commemorates these historical figures Absolutely. More um, Congress gave us five objectives. When they authorized the Department of Defense to begin this commemoration program, they gave us five objectives. The very first one, and it's the one that we're all focused on, is to thank and honor the Vietnam veterans and their families, as well as those who were held as prisoners of war, those who paid the ultimate sacrifice and whose names are on the wall, and those who are still waiting to be accounted for. That is our number one objective. The, miss, the, the mission of our branch, History and Legacy, is to help the public better understand uh, that service and sacrifice and ensure the legacy of that service endures for future generations. So by doing these oral histories, we are in fact achieving that mission in support of that first objective. We hope to help the public better understand what it meant to serve in Vietnam as a veteran from all services, all racial backgrounds, both enlisted and officers, to get a wide range of experiences of what it meant to serve during that time and because of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project and sharing those oral histories with them, we will ensure the legacy of that service endures for future generations. So in that way, that's how we are honoring those objectives. Um, and then to, to, to piggyback off of that question uh, further, um, Emily, your, witness, your organization, Witness to War, um, hopes to integrate videos in pedagogical materials for classroom use. Um, can you share some stories um, um, in ways that you've done this, in, in projects you've undertaken, or ways that you have engaged the public and particularly school children or, to, or teachers um, in um, sharing veterans' testimonies uh, in the classroom? Okay, um, yes. Um, one of our, um, one part of our three-part mission, it, which is preserve, honor, and educate, is obviously this educational component, which we have not, fully developed up until now. And it's always been kind of in the back of our minds, how do we get this content into the classroom? Because we feel that it's so vitally important to understanding war and war history is having these firsthand accounts. So I had phenomenal history teachers. Um, I learned a lot about the different wars, but I had no sense of the soldier perspective, the human aspect of what it was like to be in war. And obviously, to speak to Joe's point, I can never fully understand because I have not been in combat myself. But how do we get them to understand better what we're asking when we send soldiers into combat? Um, 
uh, one of the things that was very poignant for me in this career was my grandfather's interview. As mentioned earlier, he was a two-war vet, um, World War II tank commander, and then served in Korea. And actually, my mother was born while he was overseas. And as much as I knew about his involvement in war, I didn't know the personal stories. I didn't know what kind of heavy combat he was involved in. And until we did the interview with him, I didn't know what went into being a veteran. I, for me, it was him going to VFW meetings and him marching in parades and getting together with other, other veterans, but not this firsthand boots on the ground, the sights, the sounds, the smells of war. Um, and so when we did that interview with him, it opened my eyes to this whole new um, idea of collecting this information from veterans. And I got more involved in the Witness to War Foundation at that point. Um, and I just think it's so important for people to better understand what goes into combat, um, to have these firsthand accounts. And so one of the things that we're doing, to get back to the original question, um, is launching an educational component to our website. And so essentially what we did was we took some interns, some high school interns this summer, and had them go through all of the content on our site, over 5,000 clips from the nearly 2,300 interviews that we've done, and pull out um, vignettes from these major battles, Battle of the Bulge, Idrang Valley, um, across World War II, Vietnam, and Korea, and come up with what we call modules. So five clips from particular battles, particular types of experiences. So if you're a teacher in a classroom and you're teaching about the Battle of the Bulge, trying to bring the dry pages of history to life for students. So they can come to the site and you can see five clips from guys who were there, who felt the cold, who knew the, the frightening experience of being under artillery fire and trying to bring that to life as much as possible to create a better sense of understanding. So that's one of the things that we're doing um, and hoping to launch that actually in the next few months, but we're working on that currently. Um, Guha, um, during some of your interviews, you undoubtedly know details of your subjects' lives. Um, and when you know information, when we know it as an oral story, when we know information about our subjects' lives, um, how do we let that information shape the interview? Um, are there any methodological tricks or, or procedures we should follow? Um, should we let that shape the interview, or should we just proceed with the normal questions? Uh, yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, a we do have to know something about the subject, and we have to know something about uh, topics that we're going to be asking questions about, and we have to know something about the interviewee uh, themselves, simply because it's respect. You have to know, understand who they are and how they're situated historically, because that informs the questions that you ask. And perhaps the methodology that I employ might be a little different from oral historians in that I'm not really all that interested in the answers that people have to my questions. I'm interested in the stories that my questions elicit from them. And the stories shape further stories and further questions. Uh, so in point of fact, when you know, as a methodological principle, we say, well, you may have 10 to 15 questions in your pocket. If you go beyond question five and just start asking, you know, you're on question seven, eight, nine, and 10, then you've really not had a very good interview. Because the point is to let the interviewee shape the direction of the interview as much as possible. And then the balancing act is to say, how do you rein them back in and actually get to some of the points that you wanted to cover? because. And I, I think Mark and I alluded to it earlier, you want something on the historical record that is in that person's voice. It's not just mediated, interpreted, and analyzed, and filtered through all of the knowledge that you have purportedly about that topic. You want to let the fullness of that person's experience be part of the historical record. Um, and that really is the way in which the interviewee co-authors you know, so co that interview. Um, and that's really the guiding principle, I would say, if there is such a thing. Um, then three final questions for the group. Um, what are or are there some lines that the interviewer should never cross? Um, sure. The first, I would, you know, we've interviewed quite a few Vietnam veterans, and overwhelmingly they performed well and honorably. Um, some made some mistakes that they have talked about. And the most important thing you can do as an interviewer is not make judgments. They're going to be very, very honest, and it is that candor and honesty that you want in the interview. And so they may say things that may surprise you or shock you, and it's your job to maintain your own objectivity and not make judgments on, on what they might tell you. Anything to add, John? Okay. Do you, do you have any? Uh, lines to cross? Lines you should never cross. Um, 
if you know something about the subject uh, and you know something about the person you're interviewing and there's a particularly traumatic event, you may want to broach it with the greatest of care and consideration and not avoid bringing up something which uh, traumatizes the person. On the other hand, there, has been, there have been ample moments, and I think all of us here would agree, that when somebody broaches a topic which you think is shocking, but which they really want to get out, you know, out, out of their own consciousness and into public view, because it's the first time they've told it, or it's the first time that they've ever been able to speak, articulate it in a way uh, that's safe for them. And that's part of it, is that you have to, at all times, I think, try and ensure that you know, their safety, you know, psychological well-being and all of that, is paramount in the way in which you conduct the conversation that you're having. Uh, and that's just something which comes up on a situational basis. There's no template for it. You can't write, write it down in guidebooks and you can't teach it. Um, you won't know it till you encounter that moment of where is that tipping point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to build on that, um, that's kind of how we view things as well. Um, we will broach subjects with the interviewees um, to get a feel for what they're comfortable with. And the second that they are uncomfortable or they don't want to go further, we stop. Um, we're not there to interrogate. We're there to provide an outlet for them to share and to feel comfortable and to feel welcome to open up to us. Um, I, for me, it's just ethically wrong to push somebody on a subject that they don't want to discuss. And especially if they've told us beforehand you know, here's some things that I don't feel comfortable talking about. We will never go into those. And if somebody does get emotional, we pull back and we give them a moment to compose themselves. Let them guide us at that point. And if it's something that they want to go further into, we're happy to be that outlet for them. But if they decide that they need to make a turn and go in a different direction, we are always respectful of that because we want to provide the best experience for them in opening up to us. Can I? Can I just maybe ask you a question or okay. and Mark also a question? Yeah. Um, so somebody says something on a camera and then they later decide that they have perhaps revealed more than they wanted to know. What What is your approach to those kinds of situations? Uh, any of my uh, colleagues here? I can so, take yeah. that. Um, sure. We, um, while I always call us the keepers of these memories, we are not the owners right. of these memories. So. We have had, and it's been very rare, that somebody will come back and say, you know, I know I shared this, but it's for my family. We'll have people go on to emotional you know, outpourings that they want for their families, but they don't want necessarily online, or, or something that is uncomfortable for them. I actually had a gentleman who had an entire tape that he decided he wasn't comfortable putting out in the public, mm -hmm. and we give them that right, right. because we're asking so much of them already in opening up to us. Um, for a lot of these gentlemen and women, sometimes we're strangers. And so we understand that we're asking a lot. And so if they come back and they don't want to share something, right. we mark it as something not to be shared. Right. Um, or I'll tell our editors not to share it. Um, but we are respectful of that right. because we're asking so much of them mm -hmm. to begin with. And we do the same. We actually had a veteran come back and said, you know, I called a person out by name, right. the person they were complaining about. They right. called him out by name. I shouldn't have done that. Can you edit that out? And absolutely. As Emily said, we don't own these. It's, it's their, those are their experiences, so we honor that. All right. And to follow up real quick, if I can, sure. even after editing, if somebody wants to pull it from the website, we give them that option too, because we are here to be respectful right. of, of what they're sharing. Right. So then on the flip side though, are there some, uh, are there any lines that we must always cross? See, I'm not sure I understood the question, <laughs> but, if, but I'm gonna reinterpret that as, as how far do we push things maybe. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you, I don't think there's any question that's, that should be off the table, but going to Guha's point, you have to recognize that some of these questions are going to require, they're gonna require an, op, an awful lot of sensitivity because mm -hmm. they are difficult. One of the questions we ask about Vietnam veterans, what was your worst day? Well, there were a lot of worse days in Vietnam. And we know that that is a very, very difficult question for some of our veterans. Um, but I think that if the question is asked with respect and a certain amount of sensitivity, I guess I would say that probably all questions are on the table and not necessarily any are off the table. And, and we balance the question, what is the worst day of your year mm -hmm. in Vietnam? by immediately asking, what was your best day yeah. in that tour? And uh, we, we find those two questions elicit some very good responses. Mm. Um, 
I'd like to actually expand on what Joe just said. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the combat and the war experience, um, and we kind of go in a different direction as well in some of our interviews. What was something humorous you saw? We're talking about 17, 18, 19, 20 year old mm -hmm. kids away from home overseas with a bunch of other 17, 18, 19, 20 year old kids. Um, for the first time, some of them. So we ask about the humorous experience. It's not all the bad stuff. Um, we want to know what you ate. What did you think of the food? Um, what was the funniest thing you saw? What was something interesting that you didn't know about another culture? Things like that. So we try to get the full story. Um, and I kind of interpreted this question a little bit differently as well in terms of lines to always cross, which is kind of going back to one of my earlier responses, which is picking up on the little things. It's something that as an interviewer, it's so vitally important to push them to think of things that they might not have pulled out of their memories in 20, 30, 50, 70 years sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's being able to recognize those little tidbits and expand on those further and push them to explore their memories further. So lastly, um, as an interviewer, um, what role should, uh, should we have um, in the difficult balance between objectivity and memory? Um, are these two incompatible, objectivity and memory? Hmm. And do we, it, it, do, should we take on the role where we are trying to guide the interviewee toward a more objective interview? So the, sub, the people with whom we've been conducting interviews, and I assume this is also the case for folks here, is that we're asking 60, 70 year olds to recall what it was like, I think as Emily's point, when they were 18, 19, and 20. Um, so not only has time passed, but they themselves have had a chance to reflect on it in many occasions and reconsider what their actions and what their feelings were. Um, the subject, the objectivity question, I'm not even sure that I use that word because all of our relationships and all of our memories are intersubjective. We're always balancing them and filtering them through the experiences we've had since the moment that they occurred and something has happened. We've always accrued all of these memories and especially the case with people who have who are looking back on the long you know, duration of their lives, and they're looking through a time tunnel back when they were like a fifth, when they were, uh, as they were 50 and 60 years ago. So memory is always fragmentary. Memory is always, uh, you know, inflected by other memories, and memory is always partial. And partial in both senses of the term, it's partial because it is fragmented, and it's partial because you have a particular way in which you wish to view your actions and the actions of those around you. So I don't really worry too much about the memory and objectivity question. Uh, what is the story that they want to tell? It just comes back to that. And how you balance that out against the historical fact uh, after you get through the interview, that's, that's your own business as an interviewer. Um, and it sort of goes back to the question of do you correct people in the middle of the interview? Um, I take grave exception to my colleagues who and I insist on saying things like, well, you said 63, but I think you actually meant 64. Uh, well, does it really matter? I mean, in the moment of the interview, you can always correct that after the fact, but all you do is just is introduce more doubts into somebody's in a historical perspective and mem memorialization of an event that happened, and that takes people off track. It just doesn't really serve the purpose in that sense. Um, that's, so that's where I stand, I think, on that question. And I would uh, throw in that, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old Texas storyteller, and uh, I love <laughs> stories and really see that my job as an interviewer is to make them feel comfortable enough to begin telling their stories and telling them uh, and, and let them go with it where they want to go. Uh, if they want to go for two hours, we're, we're quite fine. We can change the chip in those cameras and, and let them roll. And uh, I, I find that uh, the tr truth and objectivity is less important than getting them to, to open that vein and let it flow. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the only thing that I would add is that as the interviewer, you have to make sure you don't ask leading questions. So. If a veteran comes back and expresses an experience, we've had some tell us about some horrible combat that they had and they were told to do it on the mission, and you got a sense that they blamed their leadership. And so a question you wouldn't want to ask, I guess, is, well, 
you probably got really angry at your leadership over that. Well, that's kind of obvious. You don't need to ask them that. They probably will tell you or they'll not, but that's not your job. So in terms of objectivity, you do have to be careful not to ask those kinds of leading questions that go to an answer that you're expecting rather than, as Guha and Joe said, just let the, uh, the veteran take the interview where he wants. And if I may add on that a little bit, um, the way we look at witness tours, we're not trying to... Um, be the historical record, we're trying to complement it, to supplement with the human aspect of what you find in a history book, what the media has covered. There's no amount of writing that can be done that can tell you what a soldier saw in combat, the sights, the sounds, the smells, and the emotions that they were feeling. So the way I look at it is, you give me a battle and I'll give you somebody who was there who can tell you what it really felt like, not the movements of the units, not the overarching, aspect of the war, the po political viewpoint. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking to supplement that historical record with the people who were there. And even in a, I know a lot of these, um, all these guys can probably speak to this. You get guys who were in the same exact unit in the same combat situation, two feet apart and saw different things. Absolutely. It's impossible to cover all of that mm -hmm. in a written record. And so what right. we're trying to do is give that human aspect, the soldier right. perspective. <laughs> Um, and what we will a lot of times do, and to speak to Mark's point, is we won't lead them by asking particular questions, but we can help guide them. So mm -hmm. sure. if they're having trouble right. coming up with a, a, the name of an island, we can help mm -hmm. bring that to them. And that's why it's important as an interviewer to know mm -hmm. your right. historical context. And we're all, um, you know, s students of military history, whether it's something that we did professionally or kind mm -hmm. of just came organically. Um, and it's important for us to be able to help guide them, especially with sure. the older veterans. Mm -hmm. For example, for us, for the witness to, uh, excuse me, World War II veterans, being able to help guide them. And so it's important also to know your subject before you dive into an interview so that you can help them through that process as much as possible. Thanks. Um, and I'd like to open the floor up to questions from the audience. Yes, please. Oh, we have a I'm sorry. I have a microphone coming. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I was going to ask uh, Emily in particular. Uh, thank you for telling me about your foundation. I didn't know about. Of course, I know about the national about the Veterans History Project because I work mm -hmm. here and I've actually interviewed some people. Um, apparently, there are other organizations that also do something similar. So, uh, is the role of your foundation to be complementary, not not competitive, to the Veterans History Project? I was just wondering if, uh, I, I know school children are certainly encouraged around the country to work with the Veterans History Project, mm -hmm. but what if a veteran is approached and says, I already gave an interview mm -hmm. to another organization. Uh, apparently the state of Texas has one too, mm -hmm. uh, Voices of Veterans uh, in Texas. So is it helpful for a veteran to give more than one interview? I know not to the same organization, but to other organizations. Um, that's a really interesting question, and actually, we do some work with the Veterans History Project and also the Vietnam War commemoration. We've actually been collaborating with Joe and Mark to interview Vietnam veterans around the country using our interviewer and videographer to help supplement their work. Um, so there is some overlap, as you mentioned, between our organizations. We donate to the Veterans History Project, and, and they come to us for things, too. Um, so we do run across people who have had interviews done by multiple organizations. Um, I think the thing I would say about that is it depends on the veteran. Um, if they are open to doing multiple interviews, we'll certainly do that. Um, and every interviewer has a different style. People are looking for different things. Some people are looking for different aspects. You know, if it was a three-war vet, somebody may only be looking towards them for Vietnam um, content, and we may be wanting to cover the whole spectrum. So mm. it kind of, you know, goes in a lot of different ways. Um, one thing that differentiates Witness to War with some other groups, though, is that we are not specifically focused on one geographical location. So we travel across the country. Um, we've been all the way to Oregon and California, um, all the way up to New York. So we, we cover a wide range of people. We also go to a lot of reunions where we get veterans together from the same units, from the same wars. Um, so we're not focused on one particular area. We don't just stay in Atlanta and do interviews there, actually going to Arizona with Mark and them in a few weeks to do some interviews out there. So 
Um, there are a lot of people doing things similar. There are a lot of vets, and there are a lot of vets in obscure areas, and I always say that's kind of my, my sweet spot is finding that vet in a rural area who never had an outlet to share their story and doesn't live in a big city where there are these organizations, and those are the type, type of people that we're fortunate to get to. Does that answer, Willa? Okay. Next. I have a question. Uh, my name is Ken. I work for the library, so it's not a planet question. Okay. <laughs> um, I believe that here in and this is for all families, you uh, talk to veterans about their wartime experience. And the question I have is, in these interviews, do veterans come to you or do you ask the question of how their wartime experiences and stories affected them as a person after the war, realizing many years have passed? Yes. Do they give you a <laughs> With, we, we, toward the end of the interview, we, we always ask that question. Uh, uh, did your experiences in combat affect your life after you got out of the Army? Uh, how did it affect your life? And, and they're very open and honest. Uh, some will say, they fought their demons with alcohol and drugs, and uh, thank God they survived that and, and have gotten along to a better place. Uh, we asked them, uh, have you visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial? And what are your thoughts when you go there? And, and I've seen men just absolutely break down and weep trying to answer that question, uh, but we do go into that. There's a whole section at the very end. We have a section called Reflections, where we ask those kinds of questions. What did the war mean to you and your generation? How did it affect your life afterwards? Some did have trouble adjusting. Some went on to become attorneys general for the states of Hawaii and other states. I mean, so there's, there are success stories and there are, there are uh, less successful stories, but ultimately, they, they all come back and, and they figure it out. But yes, great question. And yeah, that is, that's one of the things we, we address. Do you, you want to add anything? Yeah, and I, I suppose, I mean, um, if you want to look at the freedom struggle as war by another uh, name in this country, uh, and the people who were there on the front lines, as I mentioned before, uh, those were formative moments for them. And some of them carried it through with them all their lives. And some of them still carry it through with all the, uh, carry through the experience of those uh, events in Mississippi, in Georgia, in North Carolina to this day. And it shaped who they were and it shaped them as people and it shaped the kinds of projects that they were involved in. And they will tell you that it gave them a sense of identity in ways that they didn't even conceive of before. And that's always the question is it's not just what did you do during the war slash civil rights movement slash this event daddy. It's how did that you know, make you the person you are today, and how does that influence the decisions and the choices you make? And more importantly, how do your what would you say your experiences are, and how what kind of advice would you give other people who want to follow along in your footsteps? Um, so there's notions of shaping which you know these events do for you, and we try to get that out, get at that. I think as all oral historians do in every every uh, uh, interview that we do, whether it's the American Folklife Center Civil Rights History Project or any project that folks here have done, perhaps. Okay. So, oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You'll be next. Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you very much for what you do, and in particular, uh, thank you, veterans, for serving. Uh, I am the sister of a fallen Vietnam uh, vet. Uh, what I would like to know, though, is um, how can the family help the veteran prepare for an interview? Ooh. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't... Okay. I mentioned one of our first interviews was with General Tom Hill in San Antonio. Uh, then we had another interview with General uh, Cavazos, who was both a Korean War veteran and a Vietnam War veteran. And uh, General Cavazos was in the beginning stages of uh, the cognitive decline, if you will. And his wife worked very, very hard with him. We gave them the questions in advance. And this is, not everybody does it this way. For us, we always give the veterans 
the questions in advance to kind of help them prepare to start thinking about that time that happened 50 years ago. And she worked very, very hard with him to prepare him for that interview, knowing that some things would be difficult for him to remember. Uh, and he, he did well. He didn't do as well as he would have liked. A couple of times he apologized, but you know, Joe was great with him. Uh, he actually, we thought, given you know, his, his state of decline, he did extremely well. And I would credit her for, for helping prepare him for that. In terms of how other family members might help, uh, some of the veterans, they're right on the line, right up until the day of. And we have heard, you know, particularly the spouse say, I really wanted him to do this. I really thought it was important that he do it. And they kind of push them along right up to the time they sit in that chair. Some of these folks are, are right on the edge right to the very end. So. And some of the spouses sit there and listen mm. because they are hearing answers and stories that they had never heard in 40 years of marriage uh, coming out of that veteran. Um. Our process is very similar to Mark's. We actually provide an information packet prior to the interview, as long as it's somebody that we have scheduled ahead of time. If it's somebody that comes to us in a reunion situation, obviously we don't have as much prep with them, but it's a packet that asks them to kind of walk through their service. And they, a lot of times, will use children and spouses to help bring those memories back, go through their paperwork, their photos to help refresh them a little bit. Um, so that's hugely important for the families that are helping and these veterans prepare. And to Joe's point, we do have a lot of spouses and children that sit in on the interviews and help mm -hmm. kind of guide them and, and remind them because perhaps a spouse heard a story 40 years ago and they can help that veteran recall that. And I know that in the moment, it's nerve wracking to be sitting in front of a camera and sharing these experiences. So it may just help to prompt them on these stories that they might otherwise gloss over. Ma'am, if I didn't, this has nothing to do with oral histories, but ma'am, if I understand you, then you are a gold star sister. I am a gold star sister. <laughs> we have, if you would talk to me afterwards, if you stay, we have a certificate of honor program for families of fallen Vietnam veterans I'd like to talk to you about. Thank you. Sure. Got a question over here. Well, we uh, one right here right yeah. now. No. Next. Have you ever had the opportunity or goal of interviewing any of our past adversaries or allies, with the irony being our past, some of our past allies are some of our worst enemies, potentially, and vice versa. Some of our enemies are now some of our best allies. We have interviewed um, Vietnamese Americans who came here as refugees. We have not interviewed any of the five allies that provided combat forces. Um, remember, in terms of you mean the Koreans, the Australians, New Zealand's, Philippine, Thai. We have not we have not interviewed them yet. Right now, we're focused on those uh, U.S. service members that served in Vietnam. But we have interviewed some Vietnamese American refugees, and we have interviewed some Gold Star families. And I would say that in doing the research for uh, uh, writing the book, we were soldiers once and young. Uh, General Moore and I returned to uh, Vietnam uh, two times to Hanoi and sat and did recorded interviews uh, with General Vo Nguyen Giap, uh, the commander of the enemy forces, uh, with General uh, Nguyen Huan, who was Moore's opposite number in the battles of the Ai Drang, and with General uh, Chu Hui Man, who uh, was a central committee member and was the uh, was the political officer of the entire North Vietnamese Army. And uh, we, we found the more we talked, the more truthful they became. And uh, uh, we, we could not have had the same book without having heard their voices and reflected them in the story. And I will say that there are uh, many historical accounts of the uh, freedom struggle which actually focus on the responses and the reactions of people who were segregationists, white segregationists, uh, who still to this day espouse you know, pr principles and you know, patterns of thought which never change over the course of 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. So those, those kinds of stories are also available for in many other venues, I think. They should be interviewed from prison. <laughs> 
Um, we've also interviewed people on the other side. We actually have interviewed other allies as well, British Royal Marine, to get that perspective. Um, and we've interviewed a German soldier. I interviewed personally um, a young man who was a Hitler youth in World War II. And I find those perspectives interesting because they were no older than our young men that we were sending off to war. And it's interesting to see what they knew, what they'd been told, how they had been formed to have these opinions. Um, and the Hitler Youth, for example, mm -hmm. he was a kid. And, you know, and I find that perspective incredibly interesting because he was going based off of what propaganda he had been fed his whole life. And so I think it makes us more well-rounded as interviewers to understand the other side of the fence right. and to know where the enemy was coming from in their mindset as well. And it helps form questions for our veterans um, when going into that process as well to talk to them about the enemy and what they knew about them. So um, I find those interviews incredibly important. We don't seek them out, but when they come to us, we certainly take that opportunity. Yeah, and I think Ken Burns' uh, latest series has a number of interviews with members of the Viet Cong and NVA uh, who are talking about their misperceptions of what America was about just in the way that Americans had misperceptions about what Vietnam was about. And I found that uh, completely revealing uh, still to this day. Sir. Hi, I'm Joe Davis, and I'm the Public Affairs Director for the National Veterans of Foreign Wars Organization. And I want to thank Emily for the shout out there. Uh, I want to tell a quick story about Joe Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -oh. And then ask a question. My introduction to Joe Galloway, I'm a younger, much younger captain, uh, back during a Desert, Stor Desert Shield storm. Um, we had a list of, I want to say, about 125 reporters to interview General Schwarzkopf one on one. Huge list. He shows up in theater like three days after the air war started. He goes right to the top of the list, just like that. I'd ask my colonel, said, What was that? What was that? They told me a story. Young Joe Galloway interviewed a young major. Norman Schwarzkopf in Vietnam. Basically ask him, Major, what's the definition of close air support? Major Schwarzkopf says, 100 B-52 circling overhead waiting for my call. <laughs> that made it into print. They were lifelong friends. He made it into theater and boom, right to the top of the list. It's all about relationships right there. My question is, as you're interviewing your people during that go, no go uh, time, what do you do when you absolutely know your interviewee is blowing smoke? Uh, you let them talk and you deal with it later. <laughs> That's exactly, I would, uh, yeah. I would uh, uh, call back one interview that I did. And I, I, will, I would only say it was brown water Navy guy. And... Uh, I asked the lead question in our list of many questions, and this guy was a motor mouth, and he just went into a stream of consciousness rollout of utter BS, and it went on for probably an hour and a half. I never got another question in, and before it was done, I was nodding off. <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing you can do except throw that film away. Yeah, exactly how we approach it. Um, and I think I can beat that, Joe. I think I sat through about a three-hour interview one time <laughs> where I knew in the first ten minutes that this was not a truthful telling. Um, and I let him go, and as soon as I walked out of there, I marked the interview as something that we couldn't use. I think it's very rare for us right. to come across people like that. It people, is very rare. People that want to share their stories, it's because they want to get this out there, not because they are trying to gain fame or glory. Um, and if we ever have any doubts, I send it to somebody who knows more about a particular situation than I do. That's the, the beauty of being in the situation that we're all in, is we have lots of contacts with people who you know, may be better experts on particular subjects than we are, um, and who, who can do research. I actually have a guy kind of in my back pocket that if I have any question, I'll go to him and give him the information and he can pull their records and we can make sure that everything you know, matches up correctly. But it's rare. I don't come across that very often. And if somebody ever comes onto the site and says, eh, this doesn't sound quite right to me, we'll pull it until we can figure it out. So we always err on the side of caution. Fortunately, we haven't had to do that very often. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. This is really wonderful. I have a question about records preservation and how each of you through your respective institutions are ensuring that these vital stories that you're being told will be available. Are they being transcribed? And with changing technology, how have you addressed that? Um, I can take that one. Um, that's actually a fantastic question, and I've actually bounced this off of a lot of other people in the same arena as myself because, as you noted, technology is constantly changing. We are in an environment where there's always something new coming out. Somebody recently said to me, are you going to start interviewing in 4K? And I said, no. <laughs> because um, this preservation piece is something we're always running into. So um, we've got a lot of processes in place, and I'm constantly researching how to do this. We back up and back up and back up. So we have original tapes from our first interviews that were done on little mini DVs. We got DVD backups of those, and now we're digitizing all of those. So I use a ser service in Atlanta that goes through all of that tape and makes digital copies. And then we back all of that up, and now we're starting to store things off-site because this is such an issue, and as we get further into technology, the file sizes become larger. So then that you know, compounds the issue. So it's something we're always kind of thinking about because I never want to look back in 20 years and think, we had the only interview done with a guy who landed on Omaha Beach, and it's gone. I mean, that would be a kick in the gut for me. So mm -hmm. it's something we're always kind of thinking about, and it's always evolving. So always keeping ahead of that and making sure that things are backed up and constantly checking that. But it's, it's a learning curve, and it never seems to stop. And I guess maybe from the perspective of the Library of Congress and the American Folklife Center, I would point out uh, my colleague Rachel Mears in the audience who has been dealing with the shock and trauma of changing technology over the course of the last 10 years of obsolete formats, data migration, di you know, digitization, and so on. And uh, we did, uh, I think, the smart, if not the cautious thing by saying we're not going to go to tape anymore. We're going directly to Born Digital for the Civil Rights History Project interviews. Um, and all of those are backed up on our servers, which I've been told reliably are supposed to exist for the life of the Republic plus 500 years. <laughs> so uh, when the roaches are all finally in place at the Library of Congress and nobody else holds sway except them, they will let us know whether those bits and bytes are all in place. Uh, with regard to transcriptions, we it's an enormous undertaking, as you know, to transcribe materials. We built it into our contracts and our a project plan that every interview that we had was going to be transcribed fully. We used a transcription service. Uh, we would love to say that uh, you know, as we move further down the line, that crowdsourcing and these sort of digital uh, technologies like immediate uh, voice-to-text transcription tools are going to solve the problem for us. And uh, I'm here to bear witness that that is absolutely not the case. Um, and so I think this still laborious process of you know, doing this by hand, of careful listening, uh, those are all going to be with us for a very long time. So I think, back to Emily's point, our, our technology is betwixt and between the old and the new, uh, and we're always trying to find ways to in a, in a maximize those efficiencies, but we are, you know, technology is not our friend. It doesn't have to kill us, but it's not our friend. And the government doesn't handle that terribly well. Uh, thank you. <laughs> we, uh, we will be very, very happy here, here. when we can transfer everything we have to the Library of Congress Veterans History Project to ensure it, it lives on. But we have redundant processes in place now where we back them up on a shared server. Uh, we have one one person who is transcribing these, and as Guha mentioned, it is incredibly labor intensive, and he is very very thorough. Yeah. Um, so that's taking some time, but the goal is to also transcribe these these interviews as well. Right. I, I just saw Karen uh, Lloyd and uh, Rachel Mears break out in a cold sweat at the <laughs> at the thought of this coming over the transom, but I'll let them deal with that one. <laughs> from an archival background, and I'm wondering when you're talking about correcting information or editing after the fact, if you have any process for documenting that or kind of respectfully acknowledging any um, misremembered information, things that could be factually checked, especially when you're selecting um, clips to send out for education purposes or highlighting them in your collections for research. I, so I'll, I'll take that with a very specific interview from the Civil Rights History Project in which we interviewed a family down south, um, and they were prominent in their hometowns uh, in the deep south in the civil rights uh, struggle. Um, along the way, they told a story. One of the incidents they told was about uh, having to transport uh, 
guns in the back, in the back of the car. This is an African American family who were basically subject to daily persecution. And as a matter of self-defense, they had guns in their car that they transported. Now, mind you, this, instance, this incident took place at the time of the interview 50 years prior. After they told that story and this now rather, I would say, uh, you know, intense story about them fleeing uh, in cars with a 16-year-old driver in a car transporting these weapons, they came back to us about a year later when we were getting ready to post the materials online, and they said, we believe that we made a mistake in sharing the story. What can you do about it? Uh, we talked to our general counsel's office here at the library and our partner organization, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, who had actually initially approached us about this, and we decided we were going to redact that particular story. Um, now, 50 years, I think, is probably, I'm not a lawyer, but I think it's well past the statute of limitations when you know, transporting guns can be a problem. But we did it as a matter of, you know, I mean, that's, that's just, that's ancient history, you would think. We redacted that story, uh, or that piece of the story, I edited it out of the online presentation. Uh, two weeks later, um, the house of that family was firebombed. Because people have long memories. And it's not that they heard the story, it's just that they knew that they were telling their story to the National Library and the National Museum. So the point there was we did it not as a matter of legality or because we just felt good about it, but we understood the ramifications for people are far beyond our ability to handle in terms of what we do as, in, in terms of collecting their stories and preserving for posterity. There's another responsibility that obtains, and they, t and they essentially hinted at it and said we could have some problems. Um, regardless of what we did, they were, the problems still manifested themselves. Um, so that's an extreme example of it. Um, and occasionally we make corrections in the transcript, more you know, sort of the mundane things. It's like saying in 1964, we just say parenthetically, 1965 was the actual interview. We don't go back and edit out the voice or something like that. And I'm not sure if that's you know, in your experience. Um, you know? Yeah, we, I mean, it's, for us it's a, such a case-by-case -case basis. Um, a lot of our veterans, especially World War II, they're not talking a lot about dates specifically and things like that. So um, that's less of a focus for us. Um, if something were totally out of left field, mm -hmm. um, we might just leave that out because it could potentially ruin the credibility of the rest of their interview, which we know to be true, right? Um, so it's really, it's a subjective thing. We have three editors that go through our content. And so they kind of go things go through things on a case by case basis. So it's an interesting question. Um, I don't have a super direct answer because it varies. Um, we also do descriptions on each of the clips that we post online, so we can provide better context around things if necessary. And sometimes an interview clip can't stand on its own, anyways. So we'll use a description to kind of lead up to that particular story, so we can add notes in there and things like that if necessary. But um, it, just, it really just depends. It varies a lot. Uh, pretty much echo what they said. We've had one example of someone who asked us to redact a name simply because they called mm. out a name. And mm. to me, that's, that's an easy fix and probably doesn't require any um, disclaimer or caveat. If we did run across that, there's a couple ways we could probably deal with it. We will, when we start editing these to put both on our website, um, and share elsewhere, we can use title cards or we can use little notes that might amplify the content. Uh, and the guy that does the transcribing for us, he also does his own notes with the transcriptions. And so we can, we can call things out there to indicate that the viewer or the reader might want to do more research or look this up somewhere else as well. Uh, along, along those lines, uh, on a perhaps not so intense note, um, there was one interview in particular which went for four hours in the Civilized History Project. <laughs> Um, and in it, uh, the interviewee, who's rather salty and uh, a veteran um, of the civil rights movement, dropped the word, and I will, it begins with an M, ends with an R, uh, about 20 times in the course of the interview. And I heard it, and I was like, eh, it's okay. Then somebody who was more prone to like looking at these things as though they were, in, the, in light of the fact that they were educational materials being seen by small children said, can we do something about that? So I spent a lot of time bleeping out that word. Uh, it took me six hours to get through that interview trying to like make sure that I got all of those <laughs> words out <laughs> of the record. And then I left it out of the transcript. I edited the transcript so that that no longer shows up there either. You want the original interview? Come listen to it if you want to. <laughs> we have it still. So. 
So that's actually a great point. Um, and to kind of build on that, we will tag interviews. Um, mm -hmm. So we want the raw emotion and the raw language and right. what they were thinking in the moment may have been, you know, with explicit <laughs> language if they were being, you know, had yeah. artillery coming down on them. Um, so we will mark those um, as, you know, something you may want to review before you show it to children <laughs> and things like that um, so that people can use their own discretion right. but we don't particularly edit things like that out because it's not true to right. the story that they're telling but we at least leave it up to the viewer so right. that they don't pop something on and hopefully I, I would hope in a classroom setting a teacher would review material before they show it but <laughs> we try to make sure that that doesn't happen and then uh, the stuff that I mentioned about our educational component, we've actually, those clips have tried to pull ones that could be showed in a general audience. Um, and of course, if there were anything questionable, we would mark it as such. Right. But um, <clears throat> that, I think that's a great point of how to handle those kind of situations. And, right. you know, we just try to make sure the viewer knows what they're getting into. Right. I guess it's just that if I started noticing that word kept propping up like in a, every other <laughs> breath, I was like, okay, I think maybe we need to do something about this. But it's not. I, I defer to Emily and uh, uh, let the viewer and uh, a viewer be beware or listener beware of what's coming up in this interview. Hi. Um, question that I have is at the beginning of all of this, you mentioned that because the two of you have military experience, have been in combat, have been at Vietnam, you tend to draw more honest, open, mm -hmm. real answers. What about those of us who have not served, right. who would like to do oral histories and would like to be able to get those stories and that complete, complete background? How do you do that? Well, I, I don't, yeah, if I implied that I, I do a better job than someone else who wasn't in the military, that wasn't, that wasn't what I was trying to say. We do, ha we do share a common military cultural right. experience. And so you have a common language right off the bat that both of us are very, very comfortable with. But what we're finding is that more and more now, particularly the Vietnam War veterans, they're willing to share their experiences. Emily's videographer that I am borrowing next week in Arizona is also a very, very good interviewer. He's a young man, hasn't served in the military, and he manages to get some very, very good stories. I don't mean to steal your thunder there, Emily, but he, do, he does a great job. So I certainly wouldn't want to discourage anyone. My only point was there are some experiences that you simply won't be able to relate to. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not willing to share them. They may be, have a little bit more difficulty, but with someone like Joe who was there, there's that immediate connection that, you, that he doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily have to work as hard as someone else, but I certainly wouldn't want to discourage anyone from, right. from doing these interviews. Um, if I may. Um, to build on that, um, obviously I, I stated I don't have a military background myself, um, and I've interviewed gosh, around six or 700 veterans myself, and now we have our interviewer that Mark referenced who's doing interviews for us, who's gotten us up to 2,300, or around 2,300. Um, and I think a lot of it is knowing your subject, um, how, letting them understand that you know what they're going to talk about, that you've mm -hmm. studied the subject. Um, don't go in there and have no idea what they're going to cover. Don't know, you know, if you don't know anything about what branch of service they were in or where they served, your credibility is completely shot. So, and also letting them understand how interested you are. You know, it's not about your ego, it's about helping them find their voice. So going in there and, and humbly asking them questions in an interested manner and not trying to, you know, present yourself as the know-it-all of the interview process. Um, and just letting them open up and share. Um, disarming yourself, kind of. Yeah. All right, we would like to thank everyone for coming to our presentation on ongoing oral history projects and the role of the interviewer. Um, we've learned a lot today about um, two different um, veterans oral history projects and one involving civil rights uh, participants, participants in the civil rights movement. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm gonna give the microphone over to Karen Lloyd for a brief presentation. I think I can be heard, I'm used to
to projecting. But as I mentioned, we have several, we got a couple hundred different oral histories. We now have them in a format we would like to present the Library of Congress Veterans History Project with 104 of these. There are more coming. This is at the end. And we could not accomplish our mission of ensuring the legacy of the Vietnam Veterans Service endures without the Veterans History Project. So we are very, very grateful that you guys have this. And so it is with a lot of gratitude that we present that and uh, really appreciate all you've done. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much. We accept these and we appreciate the work that, that all of these groups are doing. And on behalf of the library, I would like to thank each of you for making the trip and being willing to talk with us and into this, this group about what it's like on that other side of the mic. I know I learned an awful lot today, and I hope that, that you all did as well. Thank so again, you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.